So, um, so exam one is tomorrow. Seven ten, and um, there's going to be one topic only, and that's differential equations. ODEs. Um, and so um, I already got a question about uh, number five in the practice problems on differential equations. Okay, so number five, the question is DDT of the quantity 2x t squared is equal to 50. Okay, so you could multiply, like use the product rule on this and you get, um, so 2 dx dt times t squared plus 2x, well 4x I guess when you, so, you know, 2x times 2t, so 4xt is equal to 50. Uh, so, um, you get 2dx dt t squared is equal to 50 minus... 4xt, and at that point, um, there's no way to um, there's no way to use separation of variables to solve this, right? Because if you divide uh, t from the right side, you end up with 50 over t here. Okay. So. So yeah, you could solve this by integrating factors, and if you want to do that, that's fine. Uh, I sort of put this on here, I guess, partly just to show that you have this this other option. If you have a problem where you say, like, God, if that crazy 2xt squared was just a variable, a function of t, this would be an easy problem to do, you know? So let's just, so just make that substitution um, so, so here you can't use separation of variables. So what you could do instead is um, make this substitution that says this new variable z is equal to 2x t squared. Okay. Um, well, first, uh, maybe I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So the independent variable here is t. The dependent variable is x of t. That's what we're trying to find, right? Um, since x is a function of time, uh, we know that 2xt squared is a function of time. So we're just going to define this new variable as a function of time. And um, then the differential equation becomes this. Um, so d dt of z uh, is equal to 50. And our boundary condition that says x when time, so up here, the boundary condition that was given is, yeah, so when time is equal to 1, x is equal to 5, okay? Well, obviously, that doesn't help us if we're, now that we have this new differential equation with a different variable, you know, but we can, we know the relationship between x and z, so we can rewrite this initial, this first boundary condition 
in terms of z. Um, so uh, if x of 1 is equal to 5, then when time is equal to 1, z is equal to 1 squared times 5 times 2. So z, when time is equal to 1, is 10. Okay. So our boundary condition says z of 1 is equal to 10. And now our problem is, well, we kind of have, now we kind of have layers of problems, right? I mean, we have this problem we need to solve first. Then we just need to remember to substitute back into, to get our, like, if somebody asks you to tell them what x is and you tell them what z is, that's, that doesn't, you know, that's not what they want. So, and they is me in this case. So, um, so once you find z, uh, z, you get some function for z, then just solve for x, and that gives you the function that defines x of t. Okay. So to do this differential equation, um, we have u separation of variables. We have dz is equal to 50 dt. We can integrate, um, and so we get z is equal to 50t plus c. Um, our boundary condition says if we plug 1 in for t, z is equal to 10. So 10 is equal to 50 plus c. And so c is equal to negative 40. Um, so now, um, update our function, and we get that z as a function of time is equal to 50t minus 40. Okay. And now the last thing we have to do is just um, use what we know about z to uh, figure out what x is. Uh, so this is equal to 2x t squared. Divide both sides by 2t squared, and you get that x of t is equal to 50 over t. Uh, I didn't. That should be 25 over t, right? Uh, minus 20 over t squared. Okay, so um, any problem that's on this test that I'm asking you to solve, you can solve using separation of variables. Um, if you have a different way to do it, that's fine. That's kind of, to me, that's, that's harder than this. So that's, that's fine with me if, um, but I just, I just want you to be comfortable using separation of variables. Um, any questions about that one? Or how to spot that? Well, you can, the first place you can spot it, there's two places to spot it. The first one is if you look at it and say that equation, that differential equation would be easy to solve if this was a variable. Okay, that's the first place you can spot it. But if you're in a hurry or whatever, um, you miss that, then the next place you spot it is when you get to a place where you can't use separation of variables. Once you get there, then, you know, all I'm asking you to do is separation of variables, so it gives you a reason to look back and, and think about making that substitution.
Are there any other questions on the? Yep. Just that has cosine and sine in it. Yeah. Any example? Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's say um, dx dt is equal to. Uh, x squared cosine of 2t. Um, where x of 0 is equal to 0. OK, so is this an ordinary differential equation? Yeah, how do you know that? One way you know that is that you're dealing with um, with total derivatives, not partial derivatives. You don't have the squiggly stuff. Have you ever noticed that um, in movies about smart people, like they're always doing like partial derivatives whenever they show them? It's because partial derivatives are hard. You got to be smart. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it is an ODE. Uh, the independent variable, like almost every problem that we do, is t. The dependent variable is x of t. And how many boundary conditions do we need? One, One and we have it. So. So check. All right. Uh, so we want to get all the x stuff over on the left with the dx and all the t stuff over on the right. Um, so we have x to the minus 2 dx is equal to cosine 2t dt. And you can integrate that. So you get negative x to the minus 1 is equal to uh, 1 half sine of 2t plus c. Um, And yeah, so we need to come up with, yeah, so the way it's written right now, we can't do this. Are we going to be able to do it? Well, let's find out. So let's take the reciprocal of both sides. Um, so we get x is equal to negative 2 over sine of 2t plus c. Um, yeah, that boundary condition isn't going to work. That music plays every time I make a mistake. <laughs> Okay, so let's make it, um, well, we can make this zero, but we have to make this one something. Let's make it one. Okay. Okay, so when t is equal to zero, uh, x needs to be equal to one. So we have negative one to the minus one is equal to one half sine of zero, that's all zero, so this is just equal to c. And so c is just equal to negative one. Um, 
And so now uh, we have this expression that says negative x to the minus 1 is equal to 1 half sine of 2t minus 1. Um, that's not the nicest form you could put that in, although that relationship gets it. I mean, you could plot that relationship and it would give you, um, you it would give you the same graph, you know, it gives you the same, uh, the same function. But if you can represent the dependent variable just by itself, then that's better. So uh, this would be whatever I wrote before, x of t is equal to negative 2 over sine of 2t minus 1. What? Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And this should be plus, and then this should be 2, something like that, right? Well, I moved the negative here over, so that should be plus now. The negative is on top. Ah, so... Yeah, thank you. Did that help, Winnie? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions about that one? Any other questions about differential equations on those problems? Okay, so I'm going to move on. Um, so now we're going on to stuff that isn't going to be on the test. But uh, last time we finished by talking about circular motion. And I said that circular motion um, lends itself really nicely to talking about relative motion. So relative motion. Um, and so for all of these things, uh, we're thinking about um, we're thinking about an object that's moving, and we're thinking about two vantage points. Um, you could think of them as A and B and say all these things are moving around. There's a relationship between how A and B are moving relative to each other and how, um, how A will see the object and how B will see the object. And those relationships are given, um, unless that object is a photon, then this doesn't work. But as long as it's way slower than light, this works. So. Um, the position of O relative to B is equal to the position of O relative to A plus the position of A relative to B. And then the formulas look the same. The subscripts look the same for velocity and acceleration. So V O over B is equal to V O over A plus V A over B and acceleration to A O over B is equal to A O over A plus A A over B. And um, I mentioned that the the way to remember how this sets up is 
uh, think of O, like if these are fractions, O over B is equal to O over A plus A over B. And not plus. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so let me do a couple examples. I'm going to do one uh, where there's no circular motion, and then I'm going to do one where there's circular motion. So for the first one, Let's say, um, a car slams on its brakes, and the car's acceleration is negative 8 meters per second squared, 0. OK, so what, um, what direction is the car moving? So if this is your coordinate system, let's just picture all this, what's happening. If the car hits the brakes and this is the acceleration, then, then yeah, the velocity has to be positive for this to be slowing it down. Otherwise, you have really weird brakes. Um, Okay, so the car is going this way, and um, the passenger drops his coffee, to a passenger in the car, what's the apparent acceleration? of the copy molecules. OK, so um, you know from this happening, you know, like you slam on the brakes, objects slam into the dashboard, right? So we expect, um, we expect somebody inside the car to have the coffee look like it accelerates down because it's falling, and also uh, towards the front of the car. Right, that's what this is going to look like. Um, so let's think of. Okay, so how can we do this? Well, we know the acceleration of the coffee relative to the ground because the coffee's in free fall. So um, we're going to have one of our reference points be the ground G. One is going to be the car C. And then uh, the coffee is going to be the object. And we're going to set up this equation. So the acceleration of the, OK, so. When you're first, what? I think a good way to set this up, especially when you're when you haven't done it a lot yet, is um, think of what you know, what you're trying to find. Okay, so um, what we want to calculate is we want to calculate the acceleration of the object relative to the car. And we're given two things. We know the acceleration of, so I gave you this acceleration of the car when it breaks. How would you represent that in subscripts? Yeah, acceleration of the car relative to the ground. And since it's free fall, we also know the acceleration of 
the object relative to the ground. So now we want to come up with an equation uh, that uses these three quantities. Um, and the way you can do this is the acceleration of the object relative to the ground is equal to the acceleration of the object relative to the car plus the acceleration of the car relative to the ground. So write it out. Make sure that fraction thing works. If not, you have it written wrong and you have to try it again. So what's the acceleration of the object relative to the ground? Yep, in the, and in this coordinate system, it's in the negative y direction. So 0, negative 9.81 is equal to the object relative to the car, that's what we're trying to find, plus the car relative to the ground, that's negative 8, 0. Now just do the algebra and the acceleration of the object relative to the car is equal to 8 meters per second squared negative 9 meters per second squared. So it looks like this, this object is accelerating forward and down like we knew it should. Yeah, that's, that's a bad approximation there. Any questions about that one? All right, let's do one with circular motion. So let's say this truck is carrying a Ferris wheel. This is not drawn to scale. And let's say the Ferris wheel radius is 5 meters. This is still kinematics, yep, what we started with. So kinetics is when we start talking about masses and forces. We'll get into that. Um, and so the truck is speeding up. You can represent its velocity vector as 3t, 0, 0. Um, and this is a solar powered uh, merry-go-round or whatever, uh, Ferris wheel, so they can't turn it off, so it's going. Um, and it's getting sunnier, so it's speeding up. So. Uh, Theta is equal to 0.2t. Um, at t equals 6 seconds, the passenger, the one passenger who like had fallen asleep and stayed on there, reaches this point p. And we want to know what's the velocity of the passenger at that instant. OK, so this is relative motion because we know how to. So one way to think of, I mean, OK, so think of what the passenger is doing. He's doing like this thing like this as the, as the truck goes, right? Um, that's not a circular motion. But we know that if we just think of the motion of the passenger relative to that axis of rotation, it is a circular motion, right? 
and that axis is moving with the car. So I'm going to call this point C, okay? We're going to use what we know about circular motion to calculate uh, the velocity of P with respect to C, and then go from there. Um, so we can use what we know about circular motion to calculate the velocity of P relative to C. And then we know that, so this velocity vector, um, what's that in this subscript notation? To the ground, yeah. Um, so the velocity of C relative to G is 3T00. At six seconds, um, theta is equal to 1.2. Oh, we don't, uh, that doesn't help us. Okay, so what do we need to figure out? So let's first figure out the velocity vector of P relative to C. What do we need to, to find that? So this is the circular motion part. The equation says the velocity is equal to omega cross R, right? Um, we can figure out omega as a function of time so from what we're giving, given, how do we know omega as a function of time? That's, and this is theta, yeah. but remember, um, omega is just the time derivative of, so yeah, just take that derivative. And then you have that omega as a function is just equal to the constant point two. Or in other words, what's the omega vector? Because we have to use this cross product stuff. Yep, 0, 0, 0.2. And at this location, what's the r vector? Yeah, it's in the negative x direction, so Yep, r is equal to, right over here, negative 5, 0, 0. The radius is 5. That was a different Ferris wheel. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a little one. That's like the ones outside the supermarkets. Um, okay, so then the velocity vector. Well, notice that omega is a constant, so we don't have to even plug the six seconds in there. Um, so the velocity of the passenger relative to the axis, C, is equal to 0, 0, 0.2 crossed with negative 5, 0, 0. And you get a value of zero, uh, positive one, zero. That's meters per second. OK, so does it make sense that the velocity of the passenger 
So now essentially what we're doing is we're ignoring the fact that the truck's moving for now. You can think of C as fixed. Does it make sense that the velocity would be downward? Yeah, because the omega was positive. That means counterclockwise. And the velocity vector has to be like that. And now we can go on to finding the velocity of c relative to g. Well, that's just a matter of plugging in a value for t. So when t is equal to 6 seconds, the velocity of c relative to g is 18 meters per second, 0, 0. And now we combine this stuff. Um, the velocity of p relative to g is equal to the velocity of p relative to c plus the velocity of c relative to g. And just make sure that uh, fraction multiplication thing works. So that's the right order. So we get 0, 1, 0 plus 18, 0, 0. So 18, 1, 0. What? Uh, wait. Did I? Oh yeah, it should be negative. I forgot the the thing about y again. Um. Uh. So. The cross product, it's because the cross product is this. Oh, but hold on a second. Y has to be different. So. It was a negative, but you go um, 0 times 0 minus the negative. So that's positive, And then you get the negative. Yeah. Any questions about that one? OK, so we're not going to do this kind of problem yet. There's nothing like this on the practice problems. But you can imagine like the problem I drew at the end of last time. Um, what if you had what if you had a Ferris wheel that was like this, you know? So this thing's rotating around. And this is rotating around perpendicular to it. That looks like a mess, but um, a fortune cookie? <laughs> oh, yeah. I bet you uh, have to pay a lot in uh, insurance for lawsuits. Um, OK, so if you think of this as the ground, right? This pin's fixed on the ground. This pin is, you know, call that A for axis. Then you can figure out the motion of points here relative to the axis. Use circular motion again to figure out the acceleration or position or whatever you want of A relative to the ground. And then use that to figure out the acceleration, position, velocity, whatever, of points here relative to the ground. So yeah, the it's spinning around this. It's just going around this pin joint, you know. But if you wanted to make the base spin, you could do that with 
more and more steps, you know? Like this sort of arbitrarily just says, I mean, like if you think of, um, basically these are all just like nested problems. Like, okay, what if this wasn't moving? Calculate this acceleration. Okay, it actually was moving. Okay, we'll add that on. Oh, well, actually that was moving too. Okay, add that on too. You can keep going with that, you know? So we're not gonna do problems like that, but I think you should be able to kind of roughly picture how that would work. Um, okay. So now uh, we're going to get into the mathematically maybe the most confusing topic in particle kinematics. And that is using the chain rule um, the chain rule idea to find accelerations. Um, so this is accelerations um, given velocity and position information. Or, you know what, sorry, erase that. Let's just go with, for now, let's just think of it as given velocity information as a function of position. So this is where we're going to use that chain rule idea. Um, So first of all, uh, if you know the velocity, and you know not just the velocity at an instant, but you know the function for a velocity, can't you just take the derivative and that gives you the acceleration? Well, it depends what you, so I just want to be really clear about this because it depends what you know the velocity is a function of, okay? Um, V dot is the time derivative. That's just saying it's a velocity vector. Okay, but that's, you have no information what the function is. That's right. Okay. That's right. So, um, so now it's a, this shows it's a function of the position. Okay, so, um, Here's what you don't want to do. Don't just think acceleration is the derivative of the velocity. That's weak thinking for weak people. Write it. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, the true thing, so actually, so derivative doesn't mean anything until you know what you're taking derivative with respect to, okay? Uh, acceleration is the derivative of velocity, but only the derivative with respect to time. So acceleration is d dt of the velocity vector. Um, and it's the second derivative with respect to time of the position vector. And these are important. So if you have velocity is a function of x, taking that derivative doesn't give you anything. Um, well, it gives you something, but it doesn't give you acceleration. It gives you the gradient of the velocity vector. Um, so, therefore, uh, 
you need to use this chain rule idea. that says, okay, the acceleration is equal to dv dt. Um, so what does the chain rule say in this case? Uh, so the velocity, what's d dt of um, something that's a function of x of t, okay? So this is just using the notation that I used to define the chain rule yesterday. It's equal to dv dx. That would be a partial derivative if you had x, y, and z, but we just have x here, times dx dt. And so the acceleration vector then is dv dt times dx dt. And then we'd be kind of stuck if we, um, because we don't know x is a function of t, except what is dx dt by definition? That is the, the x component of the velocity. So this is then just dv, d, ah, shoot, sorry, this should be x. So what we get for the acceleration is dv dx times the x component of the velocity. And now we've kind of taken the time derivative of the acceleration without ever knowing anything in terms of t, you know? It's kind of a cool trick, and it's useful in a lot of cases, um, especially, uh, I suppose, if you're trying to find the acceleration based on information that you got from conservation of energy. You know, you use conservation of energy and find out that the velocity is this thing, but conservation of energy doesn't ever tell you anything about time. It just tells you relationships between position and velocity. So then you could use this idea to go to acceleration, which then you might use in Newton's second law or something. Okay. Uh, what about, what if the velocity wasn't a function of x? What, it was a, what if it was a function of y? Well, that's no different. Um, so you can also say a is equal to dv dy dy dt. which is dv dy times the y component of the velocity. Or if the acceleration, uh, or you only know the velocity is a function of z, then that's just saying, yeah, that's just saying what you know. So in one of the practice problems, um, you know the velocity as a function of the z position. So that's fine too. You just, uh, x, y, and z are the positions, and you know the velocity as a function of those positions. But no matter which component you know, you can still use the same idea. Um, And in fact, if you knew the velocity vector as a function of x, y, and z, then you'd have this really ugly expression for the chain. Well, not that ugly. Um, we, I'm not going to give you any problems like that. So I'm going to write it, though, still. So what if you knew the velocity as a function of x, y, and z? Well, the chain rule says that the acceleration would be the partial of v with respect to x 
times the x component of the velocity plus the partial of v with respect to y times the y component plus the partial of the velocity with respect to z times the z component. Um, so let me do one easy example and then we'll come back after the break and uh, talk about some other things that can happen. Um, so let's say that we have a velocity vector that's equal to 2x, negative x, uh, 5. And we want to know what's the acceleration, well, what's the acceleration as a function of x. It's equal to dv dx times dx dt, which is the x component of the velocity, dv dx is the vector 2, negative 1, 0. And you're multiplying that by the scalar vx, so 2x. And that gives you 4x, negative 2x, 0. So if you knew that the velocity had this relationship with the position, then you could just directly calculate the relationship between the acceleration and the position using the chain rule. Um, so what are the, what's the trigger in your mind that should make you think you have to use the chain rule? Yeah, if you have the, I mean, anytime you're given all your velocity information as a function of position, then you know that the way to calculate the acceleration is to use that chain rule thing. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's take a 10 minute break, come back at uh, 208, and uh, I'll go into a little more complexity with this.